Jesus said to his disciples, Gird your loins and light your lamps, and be like servants who await their master's return from a wedding, ready to open immediately when he comes and knocks. Blessed are those servants whom the Father finds vigilant on his arrival. Amen, I say to you, he will gird himself, have him recline at table, and proceed to wait on them. And should he come in the second or third watch, and find them prepared in this way. Blessed are those servants. The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray our novena prayer to St. Jude, which can be found on page 13 of your St. Jude booklets. We pray together. St. Jude, glorious apostle, faithful servant and friend of Jesus, The name of the traitor has caused you to be forgotten by many, but the church honors and invokes you universally as the patron of difficult and desperate cases. Pray for me, who am in need of God's mercy. Make use, I implore you, of that particular privilege accorded to you to bring visible and speedy help where help was almost despaired of. Come to my assistance in this great need, that I may receive the consolation and help of heaven in all my necessities, tribulations, and sufferings, particularly that I may praise God with you and all the elect throughout all eternity. I promise you, O blessed Jude, to be ever mindful of this great favor. I will honor you as my special and powerful patron and encourage devotion to you. St. Jude, pray for us and for all who honor and invoke thine aid. Amen. Please be seated. One of the greatest comeback lines in all of world history happened between Pope Pius VI and his response to Napoleon. Napoleon was on a mission. He was taking the French Revolution out of France, and he was set out to impose this kind of atheistic, Atheism, uh, atheistic overview of the world on the whole world. Marched his French armies into Rome, and he took Pope Pius VI prisoner. And he deported him back to France, and Pius actually died on the way. But before he died, Napoleon said to him, Holy Father, I'm going to destroy your church. Pope Pius VI just looked at him and kind of chuckled a little bit and said, Well, good luck, Your Majesty, but... If the bishops and popes haven't been able to destroy it in 1,800 years, good luck on you doing it. And brothers and sisters, it's true, right? As an institution, qua institution, the Catholic Church should have disappeared many, many years ago, right? Thousands of years ago. We're not a business that's run on, quote-unquote, best business practices. We're not a business that's run, you know, according to all the latest uh, sort of... um, uh, ways to promote the latest marketing, that sort of thing, although we should incorporate some of that stuff. But the Catholic Church is given to us by God himself. Often when I'm arguing with a point of theology with one of our separated brothers and sisters, one of our brother, uh, Protestant brothers and sisters, they'll say to me, Father, where is that found in sacred scripture? And before I answer that question, because usually it is, and they just don't know it, But before I answer that question, I say, well, wait a minute. Why does it have to be found in Scripture? Can it be found in the church? Which comes first? And where did the Bible come from? And they kind of stop and they look at me. They say, well, what do you you mean? Where did the Bible come from? It's important to remember, brothers and sisters, our Lord did not give us a book. He left us a church. Right? He didn't hand out copies of the New Testament at the Ascension and say, here you go, here's your battle plan or Roman missiles, or catechisms, or anything else. He left a church. A ragtag group of these 11 guys, who were not the guys you'd want to have with you, you know, if you got into a fight, they were these kind of uh, scaredy guys. They were the leaders, and then all these other people, including a bunch of women like uh, his mother, and he left them. But then he sent them the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. And that same Holy Spirit compelled them to go forth and to preach the good news. And that Holy Spirit is the same Holy Spirit which dwells in us today. K 
community of sinners that we are, yet, as I said on Sunday, sinners striving to become saints. So if we read throughout the course of history, which is important, by the way, brothers and sisters, Cardinal, blessed Cardinal Newman, John Henry Cardinal Newman said, to be a student of history is to cease to be a Protestant, which is very true, right? If you actually study history, you'll see as dumb sometimes as the Catholic Church can be, we are the true church that Christ himself established. And we've had difficulties before, brothers and sisters. If you look at the history of the church in the 900s, papal elections were controlled by mafia families in those days. Bad times. But the Lord has looked after the church. We're still here, and we're still proclaiming the good news, even though we sometimes limp along. So then what is this church, this thing that can help us deal with our loneliness, our being by ourselves? Is this church an institution? Is it a mystical communion? Is it a proclaimer of the good news? Is it a community of disciples? The answer is yes to all those, right? It's a term that we can apply to all sorts of things. When we talk about the church, we might be meaning the hierarchy. When we talk about the church, we might refer to the church buildings, some of which are beautiful, more beautiful than others, right? We might be referring to the people of God. We might be referring to all of this together. And it's all true. That term can be applied to all of those things. And fundamentally, we are the church. We help comprise the church. In today's epistle, the first reading, we see that St. Paul describes the, the church as a temple. A temple. And he says, you are now members of the household of God, built upon, that was the foundation of that temple, the apostles and prophets. That is the Old Testament and the New Testament. With Christ Jesus himself as the capstone, the one who holds it all together from falling, not falling it down. Through him the whole structure is held together and grows into a temple sacred of the Lord. In him you are also being built together into a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Ah, so all people are included, Jews and Gentiles alike now, built on that foundation of the apostles with Christ holding all things together and, of course, all done under the guise of the Holy Spirit. Well, what does this mean for us? Well, like I said, this term church can be applied many, many ways. First of all, it, it applies to us locally, right? We have the church here in San Francisco and then our own parish church of St. Dominic's Church. And, of course, this is where we fit in, right? And many of us have found a home here, a wonderful community that where we can enter into. What does it also mean? Of course, as with any friendship, it can be the place that we get most frustrated, Right? especially with our brothers and sisters sometimes, because, of course, we're dealing with sinners ourselves. It can also mean the church universal. We also fit in as part of that. Because remember that we're all members of this body, the body here in San Francisco, the body throughout the world. And we need to pray for her as well. So with regard to our own loneliness and our being aside and being uh, our, on our own, do we turn to the mystical body of Christ? the church here on earth? Do we make the church the foci of our friends, the place where we actually have relationships? Do we see the church as necessary for salvation? Also, like I said, we know that there are real troubles in the church today. Do we pray for the church? Do we pray for the Pope every day? Do we pray for the hierarchy? I do, brothers and sisters. Here at St. Dominic's, now you even have a member of the hierarchy who lives with you. Just talking to him about the fall meeting of the USCCV coming up. You need to pray for Bishop Robert and pray that he might be able to be a good and holy voice in the midst of things. Within the church, we can indeed find our best friends. But we can also face the danger of becoming disillusioned. Because I said last Sunday, the church is not a club for the perfect, but as a hospital for sinners, and remains so today. And if we're looking for the perfect community, if we're looking for utopia, this side of heaven, it doesn't exist. This is a group of guys trying to get there to heaven. And to get rid of that disillusionment and to work through that, we must have a life of prayer. 
We must know how to turn to the Lord day in and day out. So that when we feel down and worn down, think, oh my gosh, this is tiresome. And these Catholics are no better than I am. You're right. Nonetheless, Jesus doesn't save us only individually. He saves us collectively. He saves us as a church. It's not just me and Jesus. It's all of us and Jesus. Read the Bible. It's all in there, by the way. You know, our best friends are often the ones that cause us the most angst, that we can get the most angry at all the time. If you put rocks into a tumbler and spin it real fast, what happens? They become polished. But how do they become polished? By smashing into each other in that confined space, yet they grind down the rough edges and help become that beautiful polished stone. That's what should happen to us in the church. Smashing against each other sometimes, sometimes out of anger, sometimes out of joy, but being ground down, being ground down by God, being purified by the Lord, sometimes through our own loneliness, sometimes through just the dopey people we meet in church. Nonetheless, it helps us get to heaven to become the saints that we are called to be. Praise be Jesus Christ, now and forever.